Despite being a repugnant film, The Whale features a fantastic acting job by its star. The central focus of the movie is the unsightliness of the main character, using family love as justification. That said, the dialogue among the main characters exhibits the true nature of humans' perceptions of each other. The main reason making watching this film worthwhile is if you would like to gain a perspective of a sensitive issue to discuss a topical modern day phenomenon. Staying true to the rest of the films Aronofsky has produced, it is a provocative spectacle that's hard to watch. Darren Aronofsky is well known for taking actors and viewers alike to their limits. His work is vastly entertaining, and their works of art I profoundly enjoy. From the athlete past his prime in The Wrestler, played by Mickey Rourke, to the obsessive egoism of Javier Bardem in Mother. However, the message and the goal in producing a film makes all the difference. This applies to the imagery, the shock, and the portrayal of certain groups within the society. Each of the director's works comes with a cavalier bravado, a demonstration of superb talent, and always the ever-present element of surprise. He stays far away from conventional cookie-cutter models and dares to go places that are sure to stick in your memory. Though it starts off innocently enough, The Whale maintains a pronounced focus on the protagonist Brendan Fraser and his body. The fat suit that he wears creates a character who is extraordinarily obese. The image is that of a character that viewers are supposedly intended to feel bad for. One would expect that by the end of the movie, the viewer will eventually develop compassion for the man and end up warming up to people with similar body types. Instead, Frazier is portrayed in such a way that one cannot help but revile the character. As he rummages around his house, he barrels over furniture and stuffs his face with chocolate, all the while seeking out information on his computer, what the heart attacks risks his gluttony will cause despite still not stopping anyway. As much as we love to look down on this character, the way that he slurps Coca-Cola, gobbles down cheeseburgers, and devours extra-large pizzas as he does, never giving himself a chance to breathe, many of us are not innocent of overindulging a few times more frequently than we are proud to admit. The viewer seems to be supposed to just watch and be glad it's not them. The main focus seems to be using the character's body type as a spectacle to stare as entertainment based on Samuel D. Hunter's writing and dialogue. The director leaves much to be desired in terms of offering a compassionate view of individuals who suffer from obesity. Charlie is shown pleasuring himself to homosexual porn in such an indulgent, compulsive way that mirrors his gluttony, nearly running out of air. This he does in the middle of his pitiful, tiny, lonesome apartment, all underscoring the alleged patheticness of the man. In a sudden turn, the movie then suddenly shows Charlie in a compassionate light. By swinging between these radical polarities, the character is given more a sense of compassion and relatability. This same level of empathy was not given to the character by the original book author. The protagonist is shown at the beginning of the movie instructing his remote college writing class. His job allows him to never have to get up from the comfort of his couch. The dialogue sounds sociable and pleasant enough. It shows some joy and purpose in the man's life. This is one of the first major roles that the actor has had in quite a long time. Frazier does offer a unique combination of large size yet jubilant innocence. One of the great ways that Frazier remarkably portrays the character's depth is through his eyes. He shows the character's kindness as well as his pain and suffering at the same time. He manages to portray the main's inner world in a relatable enough light to help viewers stick it out to the end. Nevertheless, the writing is so emphatic that he is compelled to go overboard expressing each one of his feelings in ways that make the viewer roll their eyes. When Charlie starts to hit rock bottom, he manages to lift himself back up thanks to one of his former students' essays on Moby Dick, which he is quite overjoyed with. This metaphor is related to the movie's name and grows more important throughout the film. As he rummages through his tiny apartment, breaking and knocking over objects on his way, he reads and recites details of the giant whale from Herman Melville's book. 
the screenplay is bland indeed, despite that the original intent was doubtless for the viewers to be delighted and impressed by the cosmetics and realistic fat suit. He cites quotes from the book comparing the whale to his happiness. The comparisons between himself and the whale are excessively clear. On top of that, Charlie goes as far as to declare that even he sees a parallel between his life and the whale. He doesn't get many visitors and his life is one of great solitude. The main people that drop by are his nurse, Hong Chao, and Liz, who's been a friend to him for much of his life. Though she wants the best for Charlie, she has no desire to put up with his slothy nature and gives Charlie a much needed kick in the behind. Matthew Lee Batik, who has long done the cinematography in Aronofsky's movies, chose to keep the protagonist's apartment dim and gloomy in an excessive portrayal of the sad life the man lives. As you watch the film, you yourself become horrified by the realization that the entirety of the movie will take place within the four walls of this tiny flat. On top of that, the camera angle from above adds further to the feeling of limited movement by showing what a cubicle-like dwelling space is where this man resides. Later on, his distant daughter arrives, played by Sadie Sink. Charlie had her with her mom, to whom he was married. They separated after Charlie declared himself a homosexual. Their encounter starts off quite uncomfortable as they hadn't seen each other in many years, and they discuss many of the unpleasant aspects of their relationship. After that point, the conversation moves on to a fascinating spotty conversation. Ellie adds a great amount of dimension to the movie, with her sharp, intelligent, depressed, and communicative personality, as does Chow. What also makes her role work well is that her appearance is similar enough to Frasier's that her role is very believable. What comes across as quite unnatural though is when an annoying ardent Christian, Ty Simpkins, comes by to preach the word of God. Despite that Charlie sees his death as near on the horizon and wishes to atone for his past wrongdoings, the missionary's repeated visits inside his apartment feel quite forced. Charlie is honest with the boy that he doesn't want any religious intervention. Still, the conversations between the two prove quite inspiring and eye-opening for the man. This aspect of the movie seems to come from a separate, much more stimulating film. Rather than that, the director is dead set on alternating between using Charlie as the object of obesity and pity. 